Thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. I pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. If you're in the KC area, I'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services or join us in live worship online at core.org worship. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about the service times in our ministries, please visit core.org. Hope you enjoy this week's message. To honor all copyright restrictions, we have removed some video and audio elements from this message. Hello everyone, I'm Daryl Burden, one of the pastors at United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. Our passage today is from the first chapter of James. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scriptures. Great uh, to be with you in worship, and I just want to take another moment to say thank you for joining us. Thank you for choosing to, to worship with us this weekend. It just means a lot to us uh, that you're here. And one of the things I want to share with you is uh, we love to be your community. We love to be uh, building community with you together. And so if you could just take a moment to let us know that you're here, you can go to core.org slash here and, and take some time just to register your attendance. And that way we can uh, connect and, and care for you the best way that we know how. One of the things that we recognize uh, about this season for the past four months is that we're adjusting to what has become a brand new normal under this cloud of COVID-19. Uh, most of us had, had learned to adhere to different kinds of norms and protocols. We're adhering to, to, to physical distancing. We're changing our behavior. Uh, mass gatherings are seldom seen anymore. And really, everything has changed. And, and I don't know about you, but for me, I, I feel like that little kid in, in the backseat of the car on this forever kind of car trip. And I'm, and I'm asking myself, I'm crying out to anybody who has ears to hear, uh, like, when will we get there? When will this all end? When will we get back to normal? And and, and I don't know about you, but it seems like we're just like at the beginning of this, actually. It doesn't seem like there's any end in sight, which means this is one of those journeys that's going to keep on going on. I mean, with new stories that, that, that talk about schools, you know, delaying their start or, or, or going all digital, or we see the shifting, uh, you know, patterns of, of sports or, or all of these different things with, with surging cases and, and hospitalizations and, and, and death and, and, and red zones and hot spots. And, and it seems like it just seems to all be building so much so that it seems like the four months that we've endured were, 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 were indicative of, of much more to come, which forces us to, to wrestle with this question of how do we endure? How do we manage through this season? Notice that all of, that I mentioned was this, this cloud of COVID-19 and the changes that have happened because of that. But as all of this is, is happening, we're also dealing with this raging undercurrent of, of racial injustice that's being brought to, to new light. We're dealing with national elections, presidential elections, and the endless amount of advertisements and uncertainty that goes along with that. We're dealing with the usual loads of, of illness and, and, and despair and, and death. All of this coming together makes this season, where we are right now, seem like a season of adversity, of trial, of uncertainty, or, or even of, of suffering. How do you deal with that? How are you managing through this season? 
I think collectively, as we imagine our responses, there's different ways that we can respond. One of those ways that we can respond is by, by getting angry or, or, or mounting with frustration because of all the uncertainty and, and, and different rules and, and regulations. And so we can kind of just get frustrated and angry and, and take control by, by saying we're right or others are wrong or, 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 or by acknowledging how different we all are and how we just need to go our own way. And we mount up with anger. We also can respond by, by giving in or by retreating or saying, I don't want to deal with any of this anymore. And so you kind of just give up or give in and, and, and don't pay attention to anybody or anything. And you find yourself retreating back, almost giving in or, or giving up. Another way we can respond is by being present, by leaning in, by facing our new reality, by, by learning how to adapt so that maybe through this season of adversity, we can become stronger and this idea of, of adapting, this idea of leaning in, facing our reality, that's what rests at the core of, of this idea of resilience or being resilient. And, and for the next couple of weeks, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about resilience and what does it mean to embody and to live with a resilient faith. When I think about resilience, I think resilience is defined as, as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity or tragedy or significant sources of stress. It's, it's adapting to the tough stuff in order to become stronger in the face of it all. If you look at Merriam-Webster's definition of uh, resilience, it's being capable of withstanding shock and permanent deformation. It's tending to recover or adjust easily when, when we're dealing with misfortune or change. Uh, I've been thinking about resilience a lot in light of where we are a, a, as a country, as a globe, in relation to this pandemic. And, and I've also been thinking about resilience in other ways as well. Uh, in Kansas City this week, we were hearing a lot in the news uh, about the return of NFL football. And, and that's been a, a big deal here because the, the Chiefs are kind of a big deal right, right now. And, and so I've been thinking about resilience in terms of NFL football. And, and one of the things I was thinking about specifically was last year's playoff run. It's where I go sometimes to find my happy place in the face of adversity. And, and so I was thinking through that, that, that playoff run, in particular their very first playoff game last season, the Kansas City Chiefs, they were playing the Houston Texans. And it was this highly anticipated battle. And, and what we remember about that game, if you were a part of it, uh, you know it quite well. But, but uh, the Houston Texans, they became the clear front runners. They, they jumped out to an early lead. Deshaun Watson was scoring at, at will. They, they were up 24 to nothing within the first quarter, which meant Arrowhead Stadium was silent. People were wondering what would happen based on this unprecedented deficit being handed to the Chiefs. And so you get to see, and I remember seeing the face of Deshaun Watson on the sideline, their quarterback smiling because of the, the ease at with which he was scoring. They were, they were winning. And I remember a corresponding image on the Kansas City Chiefs sideline of Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey kind of focused intently, trying to make sense of this new reality, this, this deficit. And I think, how would they react to that deficit? How would they react to their own mini season of adversity and and what you might recall about that game is that they adapted instinctively. They, they, they shifted their, their focus. They leaned into their reality and methodically, slowly, without blinking, they began to, to march in a new, confident, fearless kind of way into the future that was before them, which handed the Houston Texans their first taste of adversity as they began to put points on the board. And, and what we saw as the game played out is that the Kansas City Chiefs ended up winning, uh, winning by over 20 points. And it was this historic comeback victory. It was a lesson of resilience in the face of adversity. There's this term in sports called the front runner, and a front runner is used to describe a player or a team who is enthusiastic or energetic or engaged uh, while the game is going their way when their team is winning. But as soon as they encounter a setback, uh, they fall behind in a game, they, they begin to retreat or they collapse and they, and they make less effort. They eventually give up. And, and I've been thinking about resilience in, in light of football, recognizing that it's just a game, but I've been applying that to my faith. And, and I'd like to say that my faith is, is as resilient as the $500 million kind of style and ability to adapt uh, that Patrick Mahomes embodies. But I'm afraid that sometimes my faith more resembles a, a front runner's faith. It's easy to smile and to be big when everything is going my way, to feel faithful when everything is, is humming like a well-oiled machine. It's harder to, to boast in my faith when faced with a season of adversity our trial. And my guess is that that might be the same for you. My guess is that, that your faith is hard to find in these extended seasons of endurance or, or these extended seasons of, of suffering. 
And yet one of the things that we have to boast about the Christian faith is that the Christian faith is, is, is seen as and is known for it being a resilient kind of faith, an immovable kind of faith, an unshakable kind of faith, one that rejoices, that celebrates, that grows stronger in the face of adversity. At least that's what today's scripture was all about. James, he writes this letter to the early church, and in it he, he talks about a resilient face. This is what he says in the first chapter of that letter. He says, uh, My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith, it produces endurance, and, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. James urges the early church, he urges us to consider the trials and the adversity that we face as a reason for rejoicing because the testing of our faith, it produces endurance and it makes us better. It allows us to become a mature, lacking in nothing. It allows us to become the best versions of the people we are created to be. This is a resilient faith according to James. And oh, that I might have that same kind of faith. Oh, that I might embody a resilient faith like that. And one of the things that when you read these, these words in, in Scripture, you have to recognize that they're more than just words. These aren't words of inspiration to put on a poster. These were words that, that James embodied with his life. It's important to know something about James. James was the brother of Jesus, but he was also considered to be, by most scholars, uh, one of the most influential voices in the early church. You see his influence and authority in the 15th chapter of Acts. Uh, James, who is the leader of the Jerusalem church, the, the voice of the Jerusalem council, leading mostly Jewish Christians of that day and age, he, he comes to the defense of the apostle Paul and Barnabas as they are passionately growing and expanding in their Gentile or non-Jew ministry. And as they were causing a stir with their growing church and their ministry to the Gentiles, uh, James had to make a decision. He had to rule on behalf of the whole church as to whether or not they could continue in their mission. James offered one word of permission and blessing for this expanding mission to the Gentiles and made possible for the church to grow and to flourish for, for generations to come. This is the kind of influence that James had. When, when James spoke, people listened. James uh, levered his, his ability to, to live with his faith and to, and to rule by his faith, not just because of the authority of his proximity to his brother Jesus, but because of the way that he lived, because of the way that he embodied his faith every day. James was this living and, and breathing picture of righteousness and devotion to, to everything he did to God. He embodied a resilient faith. He was unshakable even unto death. Eusebius is a church historian, and he notes this about James as he describes his presence in history. He says that James' knees were thought to be calloused like those of a camel from praying for the sins of the people. Eusebius notes that the story of his martyrdom was, was one that where, just like his brother Jesus, James was taken to the pinnacle of the temple on Passover, and, and he was asked there on the pinnacle to deny Jesus. But instead of falling into temptation and denying Jesus as his Lord, he instead confessed Jesus as Lord. And because of that confession was cast down from the pinnacle of the temple, plummeting to his death. The story in the history books continues saying that James, he survived the fall. And as he landed on the footsteps of the temple, he, he, he started to pray on his hands and his knees, not for himself or for his own deliverance, but for his enemies, which prompted the rulers of that day to eventually stone him and club him to the point of death, which means James was the kind of person, had the, the resilient kind of faith that, that endured even in death. This is the character of the author that writes those words. They're more than words. They're, they're how it is that we're called to live with resilience in our life and in our faith. James was the real deal. And he urges us to be the same. He says, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith, it will produce endurance and, and let that endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete and, and lacking in nothing. Blessed are you who perseveres under trial because when you have stood the test, you will receive the crown of life that God has promised. For James, it's important to recognize that, that our faith, it matures by what it endures. 
We become who we're called to be by, by what it is that we seek to endure. We get better when we persevere. We, 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 we become bolder when it is that we have the conviction to suffer and to endure and to persevere through the trials of adversity that we, that we face in this life. And James lived this. He embodied this. He led by this. But he also drew upon the strength of, of scriptural heroes in the past, and he pointed to their witness as well as influencing his life. In James' letter, he, he draws upon the strength and the story of, of Abraham. And in Abraham, a lot of us know because of that Sunday school song that, that we learn as kids, or we hear our kids learning as they grow up, you know, about Father Abraham, who had many sons. Many sons said, Father Abraham, I'm one of them, so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Like, we know that song, except that song doesn't tell Abraham's story. And James drew upon the strength of Abraham's story. One of the things most people forget about Abraham is that he was living with his wife, Sarah, unable to have kids for, for a prolonged period of time in their life together. It wasn't until the age of 75 that, that God met Abraham and, and offered Abraham this beautiful gift, this covenant, this promise. At the age of 75, uh, God made a promise to Abraham saying, don't be afraid, I'm your protector and, and your reward will be very great. To which in, and Abraham said, what will you give me as I have no children? And God replied to Abraham saying, your heir will be your own biological child. And then he said, look up at the sky, Abraham. Count the stars. And this is how many children you will have. Could you imagine for Abraham at the age of 75, enduring life until that point as, as barren, and then at 75, hearing that, that all you need to do is look up at the stars in the sky, begin to count them, and that's how many kids you're going to have? This would have been life-changing for, for Abraham and for Sarah. And, and this would have been something that would have given them hope. It would have put bounce in their step. It would have allowed them to look forward to the future with great anticipation. And I imagine as they went to bed that night after experiencing God, they, they looked up at the stars and began to dream about what their life would be like in the days and, and weeks and months and years to come. I imagine they woke up the next morning so excited to start the first day of the rest of their life and, and they were anticipating, looking forward to, to burying new life only to find themselves making it through that day and that day just became just like any other day. Nothing happened. After that day, I imagine they went back to bed looking up at the stars still fresh on that experience that happened a day earlier. Dreaming, well, maybe it's going to happen tomorrow only to be disappointed again. And then it was weeks and, and, and months do you remember that it took 25 years before God would make good on God's promise that, that, that Abraham and Sarah would finally be able to welcome their, their firstborn Isaac at the age of 100? You know, we're facing this season of adversity right now, and, 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 and we've been enduring four months of it. Abraham had a faith that persevered, that endured, that suffered, that sought to adapt in unwavering fashion for 25 years. This is a resilient faith. Our faith matures by the measure of what we endure. And the truth of the matter is, Scripture is, is full of, of stories of heroes like this that are, that are measured by their endurance, that are, that are maturing in their faith because of what they're facing. And, and Abraham is the tip of, of the iceberg. You know, you think about Moses and his time in Midian. You think about Joseph and, and his enduring trial and unjust treatment and, and years away from his family. You think about all of these different figures in, in, in Scripture, the Israelites walking through the wilderness. You think about Rahab and, and Job and, and, and Jonah and Daniel and Elijah, all of these characters endured great suffering and trial, persevering, and yet emerging as heroes because of their willingness to endure with mature faith so that they could become lacking in nothing. We have a faith that becomes resilient. Our faith matures by the measure by which we endure. Paul says it a different way. He says that we are to take pride in our, our problems because we know that trouble, it produces endurance. And endurance, it produces character. And character, it produces hope. And, and this hope doesn't put us to shame because of the love of God has, has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You know, Paul says we should boast in our troubles. We should rejoice because it gives us the ability to endure, to, to have character. And that character gives us hope and hope doesn't disappoint. And so, so therefore we ought to embody these moments with resilient faith, recognizing that this, this, this endurance is going to lead us 
into this picture of the people that God longs for us to be, to become something better. These weren't words uh, for the Apostle Paul. These were words that he embodied, that he lived by. Paul experienced he, tremendous amounts of, of struggle and, and, and shipwreck and imprisonment and in floggings. Paul was ministering all over these, these kind of controversial places, and he was building community there and oftentimes would face adversity. And, and in Acts 14, he, he comes up to this town called Lystra, and while he was there, he was doing great work, only to be met by these, these adversaries from Antioch. And, and as they are, are meeting Paul in his ministry, they, they stone him, they flog him, they carry him, consider him to be dead outside of the walls of the city. And this is what we read as the story continues. These adversaries, they stoned Paul, they dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. But when the disciples surrounded him, he got up and he entered the city again. He entered the city again after being left for dead. Paul was determined as well. Just got back up again. He matured by the measure of what he endured. Truth be told, as we can spend all day looking at, at the resilient faith of our scriptural heroes, but, but we'd be remiss to, to, to not look first to, to Jesus. This was his story. Jesus was the pioneer and perfecter of our, our resilient faith. He's the one that, that, that embodied it. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is his story first. I think about the, the book of Hebrews, and I think about the exhortation that comes in the, in the 12th chapter. And, and I think about the writer and the author there. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all of these stories of scriptural heroes, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely let us instead run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken the seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him first who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. First Peter echoes this. He says, you are called to this kind of endurance because Christ suffered for you. Jesus is our pioneer and perfecter. We are uh, to fix our eyes upon him. We are to hinge our lives uh, upon his. We are to, to suffer and to endure, to go and do likewise because he goes and does it first for us. Our faith, it matures by, by our, our willingness to endure and that means in our moments of darkness, our, our moments of uncertainty, seasons like the one that we're in, full of adversity, uh, when we feel all alone, when we feel like it's never going to end, we, we need to muster the strength. We need to fix our eyes upon Jesus. We need to, to fix our lives in his strength, recognizing that there isn't anything that we can face or any place that we can go, any season that we can endure that he hasn't first endured for us. We need to remember that, that Jesus always goes before us, that Jesus leads us, that Jesus uh, moves through everything in history so that he can prepare a way for us to become just like him. He even moves through death, which means he's with us always. Uh, he loves us uh, always. He never leaves us even in death. He is there, and, and because of that, we have hope. Because of that, we can become more than conquerors, says Paul. Because of that, our seasons of adversity can be something seen as that which paves the way for us to become better, to become stronger, to become resilient in our faith so that we might better reflect the light and life of Christ to the world around us, lacking in nothing. This is the gospel this is the gospel to believe that out of something dark can emerge uh, uh, something bright. That, that out of death can come new life. That out of despair can, can, can give cause for, for hope to arise. This is the gospel. What we endure allows us to mature. Our faith can become mature by the measure that we endure. The poet Mary Oliver wrote, someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. And it took me many years to understand that this too uh, was a gift. 
I love what she says because what she's drawing uh, uh, us to understand all over again in a different kind of way is that, that this is the gospel message. At the core of our resilient faith is the notion that, that one can't fully appreciate the light until we first experience the darkness. The pathway toward the newness of life travels first uh, through death. The, the, the gift of darkness can, can lead us to this realization that, that darkness cannot overcome the light that shines in it. That, that as we're facing death, we recognize that the signs of life are springing up all around and, and that as we're walking with despair or loneliness or depression, there is great hope burgeoning within. This is the gospel. This is our unwavering and determined, resilient faith. This is what you see throughout all of scripture uh, through these heroes that emerge with their enduring ability to to suffer and to be, be adaptive and to persevere through that which they're facing. And this is the story of Jesus and his love for us. And so as we face this reality that seems to be never-ending. One of the things that we recognize as people seeking to grow in our faith is that we must become resilient, like Christ. That we must become uh, mature by how it is that we endure. But none of this answers the question of how it is that we can actually cultivate this kind of resilient faith, how, how it is that we can become strong in this kind of way, emerge through this season better than when we were when it started. To that end, I've come up with some ideas, just easy ways to, to, to seek to cultivate a, a resilient faith. And, and one of the first things that I think is essential to cultivating resilient faith is to, to read Scripture and to remember to read scripture daily and to remember daily the story of, of resilience that is found in, in, in scriptures. Uh, one of the things that I seek to do regularly is, is, is read through uh, scripture to, to build resiliency by, by reading and remembering the stories of faith and, and from them drawing strength through them to face the future unafraid. I've been talking with lots of people during this season virtually uh, uh, or, or over the phone. And, and one of the things I hear come up time and time again is I just wish I, I read Scripture regularly. I wish I had a, a more in-depth in understanding of Scripture. And what I'm going to say is this is exactly the time to begin that journey. This is exactly the time to, to engage in a discipline to read Scripture daily. One of the patterns that I'm engaging in is, is, is daily scripture readings. But I read, instead of, uh, you, know, you know, just random uh, passages throughout the year, I, I read uh, one chapter at a time. And I commit to one book of the Bible, reading it one chapter at a time, one chapter per week. And right now I'm reading through uh, the epistle of James, which is a five-chapter book. And I read one chapter every week, repetitively daily, so that it takes me five weeks to get through five chapters. And one of the things I recognize about choosing to read Scripture in that kind of way is that you're not reading to gain intellectual assent. You're gaining uh, the ability to bring Scripture into your life in a way that cements it that changes your worldview, that alters how it is that you see and hear everything. And so for the last week, I've been reading through the first chapter of James, and I've been hearing this message of resilience over and over again, and it's changing how I'm living. It's changing how I see the world. And in fact, one of the things that happened earlier this week is I was reading through James 1, and, and I had the news on in the background, and I heard the same passage of Scripture I was reading. I heard it echoed on, on, on a morning news. And I looked over at the news channel. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I saw President Barack Obama reading from the first chapter of James. And so my attention was drawn to his reading. And I realized that he was delivering the eulogy for, for John Lewis, who passed uh, earlier this week as well. And he was uh, narrating John Lewis's life in the context of the epistle of James. And, and as he was reading through that epistle, I was drawn to the life of John Lewis and the resilient faith that he embodied. I was drawn to stories of this man who, who accomplished these extraordinary things. He was one of the first uh, freedom riders. He was the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was the youngest speaker on the march at Washington at, at 23. He was the leader uh, of the march on Selma to Montgomery at 25. He was a member of Congress for, for 33 years. He was born as just a child into modest means. He was uh, born to... to, to, to Parents who were picking other people's cotton in the heart of the Jim Crow South. He was uh, inspired despite his socioeconomic stance, stance uh, at an early age, driven, called to live a life of nonviolent resistance and civil disobedience in the civil rights movement. He, 
He was one of the early organizers in, in the Nashville campaign in 1960. He endured multiple uh, incidents of discrimination and hate. He had milkshakes poured over his head, cigarettes extinguished on his back. He had uh, boots placed into his ribs. Uh, when he was leading the march from Selma to Montgomery, he, he found himself kneeling and praying only to be struck with a billy club in, in the head, which uh, left him with a skull fracture. He presumed that that might lead to his death. He endured so many things and yet remained unwavering in his faith. I was turned on to his story because I heard scripture being read on the news. Scripture that I happened to be reading daily. And what I found was inspiration in a new kind of way. When we read scripture, when we engage in the daily discipline of, of bringing God's words and strength, his resilient faith into our life, it opens our ears to hear things brand new. To be inspired by by people who we've never met before, who we never had the privilege of learning about. Now, I had heard of John Lewis, but I hadn't heard the details and the depth and the level of his story. But I found myself inspired earlier this week by this child who is unmovable, always adapting, enduring great trials to grow to become a person of resilient faith. If you're looking to cultivate a resilient faith, read scripture daily. One of the tools that we have at Resurrection is the Grow, Pray, and Study Guide. And there you can get daily scripture readings. And this week, what you're going to find are daily readings about stories of resilience in scripture that I want you to be inspired by to grow in. A second thing that you can do to cultivate a resilient faith is to, is to be present. It's, it's to don't run away. Be in the moment. One of the things that we're going to do later in this worship service is we're going to have a chance to participate in, in the sacrament of Holy Communion. And one of the things that we recognize about that sacrament is it gives us a chance to remember the night before which Jesus gives himself up for us. It was a season of adversity for Jesus. It was a time when threats of death were swirling around him. And rather than running away or hiding or, or burying his head in the sand or even getting angry or frustrated, Jesus Jesus was present in that moment. He was still in, in that moment. He drew his, his family members, his friends, his disciples together in that moment so that they could be still and share one last supper. In that moment, with all of the adversity surrounding them, he shared a meal of love. They shared words. They shared relationship. They became friends. They offered words of encouragement to each other. They, they broke bread together. And they gave us a model for what it looks like to face the future unafraid. It's to be present in moments with each other, even when the world seems to be falling apart all around us. Do you want to cultivate a resilient faith? Be present. Seek out uh, your family members or friends. Seek out uh, relationships or connections with your, with your neighbors or, or coworkers. Find ways to, to build community. And, and if you don't feel comfortable getting out safely to do just that, then be present where you are as you are. Turn off all of the distractions and be still in the moment, allowing God to be with you, to remember that God never leaves you and just breathe in God's presence through the silence. Second suggestion is just to be present, to be still, just like Jesus. A third suggestion would be to, to pray. Uh, to pray and, and then to pray some more. One of the things that we have to do to recognize that, that God is with us always, no matter what it is that we're facing, that God uh, is leading us, walking with us, never abandoning us or forsaking us, but going with us, is, is to engage God in conversation. If you're turning to God in prayer, then you're recognizing that God is actually with you. And so I want to urge you to, to pray. And that's what James urges the earliest church to do as well. He says how anybody who needs wisdom, they should just turn to God. They should ask God in, in prayer. They should, they should pray to God. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve. So I'd say pray for resilience. Pray for God to fill you with the strength of the Spirit so that you can accomplish abundantly far more than anything you can ask for or imagine. And if you need more of a structure to prayer, then I want to urge you to pray before you read Scripture every day. I pray before I read scripture and I, and I simply say this. I say, God, speak to me through the words that you're, you're going to implant upon my heart today and, and push them into my life so that I can't help but embody them today. Pray before you read scripture as a reminder that God is with you. The last thing I'd encourage you to consider as a way of cultivating a resilient faith is to be thankful. 
You know, fear and adversity seem to, to take up a lot of our bandwidth and they don't leave much room for us to appreciate all the things that we have to be thankful for. And, and there is so much for us to be thankful for from the rising of the, the morning sun to its setting. We have every day as a gift that has been given to us and, and everything in it, it becomes a gift for us to celebrate and to be grateful for. And so, so begin each day by giving thanks for finding reasons to be thankful. And, and then once you find those reasons to be thankful, I want you to share them with somebody because we're always looking for ways to, to connect and to, and to share how we're doing with the world around us. Why don't you share reasons for thanksgiving? Sometimes I think we could change the world if we began every one of our small talk conversations with those people we bump into daily by, by asking them not first, how are you doing today? But by asking them a question about thanksgiving by initiating every conversation, by saying, what are you so thankful for today? How might that change our disposition? How might that change our conversation? How might that change every social interaction by forcing everybody to think first before speaking about what they're thankful for? I woke up this morning thankful for my kids, that I have the privilege of, of being able to care for my kids, to spend time with my kids. And so I try to let them know about that Thanksgiving I also found myself a few days ago so thankful for having the TV on in the background as I was trying to, to find some peace and quiet uh, in relief of my kids uh, because I saw this awesome commercial. And it was a commercial that was uh, speaking about sports, but it was speaking a message of resilient faith into my life. And as a way of closing this sermon, I would love for you to be able to experience it in the same way. Now let's take a look. This message was about athletes, or maybe it was about our country, or, or maybe it was about us. I think this message is for the church. It's about how it is that we ought to live. As I was watching that commercial, I could hear James' voice speaking through it. As he encourages us in the same kind of way, as he encourages us to embody a resilient faith. He says, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, Consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith, it produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Blessed are you who perseveres under trial, because when you have stood the test, you will receive the crown of life that God has promised. My hope is that together we might cultivate a resilient faith like this. And my prayer is that we might encourage each other to embody it always until together we experience uh, the kingdom of heaven here on earth just as it one day will be. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the stories of strength and resilience. We thank you for Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Help us to draw strength from his sacrificial love. Help us to go and do likewise, to face the future unafraid, to live boldly and courageously, to live as those called to love others, to serve others, to encourage others resiliently as together we face this season of adversity. God, draw us as your people into a resilient community of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again online or live in worship. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week.